Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Information Lab. Here at the Information Lab, we dedicate ourselves to helping people make sense of data using Tableau and Alteryx. You're back with AD here with you in this third episode in the series of web trainings, where we'll focus on getting the most value from your geographic data. In the last episode, we explored the nature of spatial data and what is happening behind the scenes when you connect to it in Tableau. We saw how useful the Tableau interface is for answering rapid fire exploratory queries, particularly those around business questions like, where are my objects, my stores, my people? And today, we're gonna dive into what happens when we want to figure out how many objects we have in one place. Answering questions like, how many existing customers do I have in this region? How many stores do I have in this city? And for all you folks interested in exploring the same data I'm using, I'll add some links in the description box below this video. Remember to hit pause in the recording at any time so you can follow along if you'd like to. You also need to know that I'm running Tableau Desktop version 2020.1. If you're on a release before 2019.2, some of the features that we talk about in this series won't be available to you. But hey, this is a great excuse to get IT to upgrade you. Now, without further ado, let's get that value add from your geographic data. And we begin with a rather unfortunate truth. All maps lie. When we aggregate spatial data to ask how many objects there are in a certain place, there are a particular set of lies that we can tell. Now, it wouldn't always be possible to reduce that number of lies to zero, but we can at least share the caveats of our analysis with our end users. We can also take steps to map responsibly to minimize the misleading effects of our visualizations. And we'll cover that today as well. Two really useful mapping techniques for these types of how many questions are proportional circles and choropleth maps, also known as thematic maps or filled maps in Tableau. And before we get into these, we need to cover off a little of the fundamental spatial principles involved in aggregation. And again, you may have heard elsewhere that all charts lie, and that's true. And maps are a form of chart. And therefore, that is why all maps lie. Any aggregation or grouping of data that we perform moves us away from the picture of the raw data in some way. That's inevitable. And one of the key misleading elements is evident in something called the Modifiable Aerial Unit Problem, also known by the acronym MAUP. Now, this is a big issue. It's the subject of journals, academic debate, and some of the more readily accessible explanations I've linked in the description box if you wish to read some more. Before this webinar, I'll aim to break it down as simply as possible. And for me, it comes down to this. When trying to figure out how many objects we have in a particular area, we can very easily manipulate the answer to that question without altering the data itself. Either knowingly or not, Purely by our visualization choices, we can emphasize or minimize. That's the crux of it. Now, here's a bit more with some examples to consider. With the modifiable aerial unit problem, we get both scale and zoning effects. The scale effect relates to the size of the areas that we use to aggregate or group up our data. The zoning effect relates to the exact way in which the boundaries of those areas are drawn. Changes in either size or shape of the areas we use will bring about changes in the apparent geographical distribution of the variable that we're looking at. It's a product of the visualization choice, not the data. And while we typically see the scale effect more regularly in mapping, it's important to be aware of both. And we can see how they work in some examples. In the first, we'll use the population aged under five in Alabama. And this is data from the United States Census. And census data is collected at the household level. 
So if we use the underlying data, we'd be trying to show about 1.7 million points on the map because Alabama has about 1.7 million individual households. But in order to simplify that view and allow a user to compare values in space, we've aggregated that data to an area. Census tracts on the left and counties on the right, counties being the larger area, as you can see. Now, aggregation or grouping into larger areas involves a more pronounced averaging, and that acts to smooth out the underlying data points. It gives a false impression of sameness in the area we're looking at. We effectively lose spatial information if we aggregate to too large a region. We lose the variation that is inside the area that we've chosen. Now, in the zoning effect, we can use this example to understand it. Here we have exactly the same number of points in each image, and they are in exactly the same place in each image. Just take us a second to look at those black dots. Now with the zoning effect, we get a different aggregated total of dots depending on the way we draw our boundaries. Look again at the picture. The dot positions haven't changed, but that total aggregation number of one or two or three or four has. So depending on how we draw the area, we might get the appearance of high values in some places, the appearance of low values in some places, or a smooth combination of both. And again, that's not about changes in the underlying data. It is an artifact of the visualization technique. And for those of you interested in US politics, this zoning effect is at the heart of redistricting. It effectively allows gerrymandering or rigging the vote to take place. Now, in reality, any space on Earth can be divided in an almost infinite number of ways. And in order for us to do any work, to move our analysis forward, we're going to have to pick one. You may be in a, in a situation where the decision about what to do, which areas to pick for aggregation are not your own. But either way, it's crucial to keep in mind that any pattern we see in a map may be as much a reflection of the choice of our boundaries rather than the underlying data itself. So with that in mind, let's actually draw some maps. I'm going to move into a Tableau workbook now. And first off, we're going to have a look at proportional circles. And we've returned here to the traffic stations example that we've had in previous episodes of this series. If we look to the bottom left of the screen, my Tableau workbook, you can see that I have 1,012 marks in the view, representing the precise locations of traffic monitoring stations across the city of London. The unique location ID that you can see that I have on detail identifies each monitoring station. In the measures, I also have fields that refer to the number of vehicles passing by these stations in a certain year. And I can size the marks in the view by the counts of particular vehicles to enrich my map. So I'm going to do that for HGVs, for heavy goods vehicles. I'm going to grab that measure from the data pane and drop it into size. Now, by doing this, we're creating a proportional circles map, aggregating data to previously defined point locations and using size as a way to help the viewer comp compare the significance of those locations. In this case, it's the number of HGVs passing each station. Now, watch also how I can adjust the size to make things more clear to my viewer using the slider. You see, I, I've done this a little already. I can move things around to see what works best. I can also get into more of the sizing by looking at this menu on the right hand side of my canvas. Click the drop down arrow. 
can go to edit size and I have a little bit more control over the exact size that I'm going to see in the view. You'll also notice that I can change the opacity in the color to give me the ability to see overlapping dots. And in this view, where I'm looking at the total number of HGVs passing these stations, what I now see is really the key arterial roads in London. This loop across the north, this kind of circular arc, that's a north circular, quite an important major road. We can also identify this important east-west axis moving into the city and out, and also this north-south axis moving into the southwest of London. If we look also, the M25 is a large motorway that sort of encircles Greater London. We can see that for those traffic monitoring stations, we're picking up large numbers of heavy goods vehicles that are also orbiting London. Now, at this stage, that's quite a useful map to me. But perhaps in another situation, I'm thinking I may want to reduce the number of marks in the view so it's easier to look at. Maybe I'll try to remove some clutter if I can. So all I'm going to do here is replace the unique location ID with the location name field. I'm going to drag location name in from the dimensions. And I'm going to drop that over the top of location ID, and that's going to replace that field in the detail. OK. Now, this aggregates the stations to a less granular level. You can see we have far fewer marks in the view. And it still shows us the number of HGVs we have, but this time it's aggregated not to each station, but to each borough in London. And we've made that aggregation, but of course, by doing that, we've lost the granularity of exactly where each traffic station is. And there will always be that decision to be made about the extent to which we can aggregate we'll have to decide what loss of detail is acceptable to us for each scenario that we're looking at. Now, if you'd like to try this out at home, we're going to make a proportional circle map using the World Indicators data set that comes built in with Tableau Desktop. First off, let's move to a new worksheet. I've called mine Prop Circles World Indicators. You can pause the video at this point if you'd like to rename your new worksheet. Now remember, we want to add a new data source. And so all we need to do is hit the plus button on this top ribbon by the cylinder. And we can connect to a range of files. Now the world indicators file is preloaded with Tableau. So you'll see it done in your save data sources section down towards the bottom of that connect to data pane. You'll hit world indicators and bring that in. Now, when you bring that in, you can see that someone has taken the time to organize all the fields very neatly into folders, this kind of subdivided grouping system. And that's really worth doing if you have a lot of dimensions or measures. And I'm going to add a card on the screen now that you can click on that's going to take you to a wicked little blog from a colleague of mine, Louise Lay, and she takes you through how to put your fields into folders to keep your data pane nice and tidy. Now we're going to take a, a look at the fields that there are here. So notice that country region has been identified by Tableau with the globe field in blue. And also notice that we have generated latitude longitude fields. And that means that Tableau is using its internal geocoding engine to identify the locations of those countries or regions. Now, if you're following along at home, what I'd like you to do is build for me a map that's going to show the total CO2 emissions at the country level. And we're going to choose the year 2010 to do that. That's the last complete uh, year for the CO2 data. 
And we're going to do that using proportional circles. If you're going to do this at home, remember to hit pause on the video. And also remember, you don't need to, to worry about matching the exact color that I have here. But your map should look the same. OK, if you're back with us and you had a go at that, let's take a look at building out that solution. First off, we wanted the year 2010. So I'm going to put that on a filter. And I'm going to select years. And 2010 is the one that I want. So select 2010, hit apply. Next up, I know I want a map here. And I know that if I double click a blue globe field, I will get that detail in the view. Here, Tableau is generating those latitude, longitude locations for each of those countries. OK, so we've got a good start. All I'm going to do is just use this tool to drag my map a little more towards the center so we get the bulk of the countries in. Right, Chris, so we've got circles. Now, the next thing is we want to size those according to the CO2 emissions. So if you had a look in your fields, CO2 emissions field is under the development folder. And as we did before, we're just going to drag that measure onto size. And I chose my favorite burgundy color for this. I washed it out a little bit, but that's a step that you don't need to worry about. The key thing is to make the sizing a little more sensible. So we're going to make that a little bigger so we can get a sense of what's going on. And I might go back and just drop that opacity a little again. OK, so hopefully you got that at home. If you did, well done. And with this technique, as you're building, you might have noticed that we're going to run into some issues. If we have a large number of locations that are tightly packed together, if we take a look at the continent of Europe, for example, we have that situation. We have some overlap. And that overlap, we could make those adjustments in color to alter the opacity, as I've done. Again, we click on color in the marks card and just use the slider and opacity to drag that a little further down to a lower number. Lower numbers will get you sort of more see through marks. And that will help if you have overlap. With a large number of locations, though, it might be better to consider a different approach altogether because overlap and clutter might be preventing the user from really gauging the meaning when we use size as a way to code the data set. Not just from, from an overlap perspective, but also if we take a look at the continent of Africa, it's quite difficult to pick out any variation because those dots have become quite small. So we're not really able to compare the variation in space. Instead of this technique, we could aggregate to an area larger than the point and use color to code the data rather than size. So what we're going to do now is duplicate this sheet that we're working on, and we're going to rename it. So I'm going to right click on that sheet that I'm working on. I'm going to hit duplicate. And I'm going to rename this CO2 Coropleth because that's what we're going to build. OK. Now, with Coropleth maps, what we're looking at is putting a metric on color rather than size. And by doing that, we're getting the variation in that metric through space. And this technique should allow us to compare values between one place and another. And we can do this easily with any of the default areas that Tableau has. I can show you this using the CO2 data that we have here in the view. All I'll do is drag my metric, my CO2 emissions, onto color. And we want to change that mark from circle, if you have that to map, and that gives us our basic filled map. What I'm going to do is move away from that default color palette. So I'll move over to the right-hand side, click the drop-down menu, and hit Edit Colors. 
and I'm going to use this Makeover Monday sequential color palette, this nice kind of darker blue teal, and let's apply that. I'm also going to move into the color uh, option in the marks card. I'm going to just change the opacity back up again. There we go. And we'll adjust the borders slightly. Okay. Now, aesthetically, we're subjectively, perhaps, looking at a simpler, less cluttered map. And let me, I'm still not happy with these borders. Let me make them a little bit darker. Okay, a bit happier with that. Now, as I was saying, we, we potentially are looking at, at a simpler, less cluttered map here, because we don't get that overlap. But this is where the danger is. And just because we have a map that looks good, it doesn't mean that it's truthful. And here's the thing with any choropleth thematic map. We cannot plot raw values. If we do that, we are telling lies to the audience. Looking at this example, we see China here. And it seems to be churning out the greatest CO2 emissions. And by raw number, it is. And that might be something that you're interested in and something that you want to visualize. And that's great. Go for it. But the choropleth map is not the technique to do that. This mapping technique is designed to help people compare values through space. If you want to show raw numbers, go for a table or revert to the proportional circles approach. But the choropleth map is not the approach for raw numbers. And here's why. You can see that each area that we have on this map, each country, is a different size with a different population. And China looks to emit a huge amount of CO2, but China also has about a sixth of the entire world's population. And that population is clearly driving those CO2 emissions. So really, all we've done here is create a map of population. If we want to use the map to investigate how CO2 emissions vary in space from country to country, we need to create a standard baseline that will allow us to do that. Because CO2 is driven by industrialized populations, we're going to use population as that standard baseline. So let's create a CO2 emissions per person field by clicking the carrot this drop down in the top of the data pane. We'll hit create calculated field. Let's drag this down a little. And we're going to call this CO2 per capita. Now, the first element of this, uh, this calculation is going to be that raw CO2 value. So I can begin typing that in. And here it comes. When I talk about creating a per capita, per person calculation, or a per unit area calculation, per anything, means I'm going to divide by something. So I'll stick a division, a slash in there. And I want this, again, this calculation to be per person. So I need the population figure. And I have that down here in my measures in the population folder. If I know it's there, I can start typing population and I want that to be the total population. I can also, which I'll do now, just go into the data pane and drag the total population into my equation. And we're going to okay that. You can see that I get my new measure down with my equal side sign beside it, that means that I've created that. And what I'm going to do now is remake this map and we'll see how things change. So let's drag CO2 per capita and replace the raw values with that. 
going to go back and just make those colors the same and then we're going to have a look at how things have changed. That border is about right. Okay, now we see some big changes have gone on. And look how China's significance in this map has, has dropped away. It's now a much lighter color. And instead, we can still pick out the United States. Even corrected for population, its per capita emissions are also large. Australia now jumps in to the view. Down here in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, we know Australians are big into coal. And also, let's take a look at the Gulf states. This is where the bulk of the world's oil comes from. We now have their significance coming into play. Oman, Saudi, the UAE, Qatar, Kuwait. We can now say one country is more or less than another because we have a standard baseline to compare each country's rate, its CO2 per capita. Now going back to the aesthetics of the map, with this default color palette, it perhaps doesn't do a fantastic job in pulling out smaller values. We're, we're able to see Australia, the United States, the Gulf states, but many of the other nations fall into the same light blue green color. So we need to make another adjustment to this because although we have the correct per capita metric in the view, we still can't effectively compare those values in space. We could employ a logarithmic trick here instead to get more granularity in those lower values, but that's a bit of an iffy one. And the payoff is we lose the ability to pick out the subtleties in the higher rates. And I'll show you how that works in Tableau. Right on the shelf in that calculation, I'm going to double click my, my original CO2 per capita metric. And I'm just going to wrap that entire calculation in a log function. All right. Now, again, that gives us much, much more variation across the continent of Africa. And just very quickly, I see a couple of things that aren't right. So what we need to do here, I'm just going to drag CO2 per capita up into dimensions. And I want to get rid of any null values. And that should take care of South Sudan. Excellent. Now, as I was saying, we do get much more variation across that entire continent of Africa. But if you look in those higher rates, we lose that granularity here. We see the United States kind of blend into Canada, to Iceland, Greenland, quite a lot of Europe. It's a little bit difficult to tell those apart. And this approach is also problematic because we've moved away from plotting the underlying data and it might be difficult for a user to understand what's actually happening. So potentially it's better to stay away from this and instead take the time to understand the data and group it into bins. Now, I've done this looking at the distribution of the CO2 per capita data. I've grouped it into bins and I've used that as the basis for a new color palette. And I have that color palette here in a notepad file. So I'm going to take that out. And we're going to copy this across into a new, to a new calculated field. So clicking the drop down at the top of the data pin, create calculated field. And let's call this color palette. And I'll paste in everything that I had in my notepad. Marvelous. Now all I'll do is drag this color palette into the view. I'm going to replace the CO2 per capita metric with the color palette. Now, originally, that gives us this kind of rainbow effect, but that's okay. We're just going to reset that. 
by clicking the drop down and hitting edit colors. I'm going to go back again to that same Makeover Monday sequential color palette that I have. I'll click assign. I'm just going to let my lowest values actually have a little bit of color. And then I'll hit apply. Okay. Now you can see I have the year 2010. I've excluded null values from my CO2 per capita. And you can see that I'm able to pick out the United States and Canada as being different. Australia, the Gulf states as being high values. We can see China. We can also see South Africa, Venezuela, and a little bit, I think that must be Puerto Rico. I'm hoping, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But those that remain in the lightest color band are a genuine representation of the data. So doing this color palette in this way gives me more control over how these colors are going to be assigned to my data. Now at this point, we're getting very close to something very passable. But there is another final improvement to make to this map. And unfortunately, it's not something that's available in Tableau right out of the box. And that's the need to use a different map projection or layout than the one Tableau uses. The rationale for this is, again, about distorting the view, this time in the shape of the countries that we have. Now, I've covered this extensively in the Responsible Thematic Mapping episode of this series that you'll see linked just now on the screen. Please have a look at that in order to fully understand what I've done, because it is essential to employ this technique when we have maps that include population data. Now, as I said, the final step is using a different map projection. And I've done that in advance by joining this World Indicators dataset to a natively spatial file, a GeoJSON file in the Eckert 4 equal area projection. And again, I talk you through this in the linked video, so do please watch that to find out all the steps. The reprojected GeoJSON is from that awesome tool I've also mentioned previously called Dirty Reprojectors, built by the folks over at Development Seed. It's linked in the description box below this video too. Now let's dive into my worksheet. And we're gonna have a look at my data source. And let's actually just take a look at that and how I've set that up. So again, you can see that there's a join that's based roughly on the name of the country. I've had to do a little bit of fixing up here to make the naming conventions match. But that's just part of the join calculation. If I go back into my worksheet, I'm going to make a final version of this map. And I'll begin as I did before. I'm going to grab the dimension for the year. And I'm going to bring that into filters because I want the year 2010. So I click 2010 and I'll hit apply. OK. In order to build out this map, I want the geometry from my GeoJSON file. So I'm going to double click that and I'll see the world pop into the view. Perfect. Now you notice that this is different from the default map that comes in for Tableau. I've previously washed this out. If I put that back in, you'll see that that map layout, map projection is very different, especially at the equator moving towards the poles. So look how different the north of Canada into Iceland Greenland looks. I'm going to wash out that Tableau background again. I'm going to start working with this map. Now, I want to be able to interrogate and, and manipulate each country individually. I currently have a geometry for the entire data set that I have. So what I want to do is add country detail field from the dimensions. I'm going to use the admin field to do that. So I'll drag admin onto detail. And you can see that I'm now able to interact with each of these individually. 
Now, next up, I want my CO2 per capita. Now, here, I've already converted that. Uh, let's not do it that way. So we'll bring this back down, make that a measure, just so we can get this view built originally and then change the color palette. And let's go to sequential. And this isn't showing us an awful lot. So we'll go in for a color palette. Here we go. And again, you can see that South Sudan has popped in there because we're not getting rid of our null values here. So let me make this discrete. And we're going to get rid of null values again. See, South Sudan disappears. We have a few countries that have dropped off as part of the join. And if I was going to publish this for real, I'd just go back and make sure that join calculation was firing off correctly to grab back all the information that I needed. For now, I'm just going to right click that and filter the data. That is a null. All right. Now, this is something I'd be much happier to publish, especially if I make that change in the join calculation to get that firing correctly. In terms of the underlying data, I have aggregated data to the country level, but I've created a standard baseline that allows the map to function properly by allowing comparisons between nations. I have that per capita calculation. I've binned the data to create a data-driven color palette that allows effective comparison. And finally, I've used an equal area projection to minimize the misleading effect of distortions in country size. It's satisfying and it's hard work, but that's the job at hand. We must try to deliver an accurate product for our audience. Next time, we're going to push through into some of the more recent additions to Tableau's spatial toolkit, figuring out how to exploit spatial calculations and spatial joins to take our location intelligence further. Until then, keep exploring and feel free to reach out to us here at the Information Lab for solutions to your data challenges. To stay up to date with all our YouTube content, hit the bell icon to subscribe to our channel. I'll see you all next time.